Well, thank you for joining us again tonight. Uh, I'm your host, Bill Dixon, on the Lessons of Vietnam show. Uh, we look forward to uh, doing our show tonight about uh, the uh, – United States and Vietnam War by dates. We're going to try to give you some uh, different dates and so forth that things happen or or didn't happen and so forth. But to get started, we are broadcasting from the studios, courtesy of Nissan Communications, World Headquarters here in Raleigh. Uh, if you need to get in touch with me to give me some information or or tell me what I did wrong on the show, you can go to dixonbuild 80 at yahoo.com. But what we'd like for you to do, if you feel like it tonight, is uh, either come in on uh, telephone as 919-518-9773, as it says there, or even better, go on to Computers 2K Voice, that is Computers 2K Voice, and give us your uh, comments. Uh, you have a story you'd like to tell us, that's okay. We can do that, too. Uh, just keep it in Viet and something to do with Vietnam, uh, how it affected you or whatever. But... Uh, as we go along, it's very important, as we keep telling everybody out there, uh, the Veterans Crisis Line, if you are a veteran or you know a veteran and you feel like they are in crisis or you are in crisis, please pick up the phone. It, they got people on the other end who are just there just to help you. There's help out there. Uh, all you got to do is reach out for it. Now, there's somebody out there waiting to talk to you, and you might be surprised their problem might have been worse than yours, and they solve theirs, and they can help you uh, solve yours. So as we get started on the show, uh, let's see, the, the title, what's what's the title? Okay, there you go. United States of America and Vietnam War by Dates. I couldn't remember what it was for a little bit there. Uh, the American flag and the former South Vietnamese flag. So we're going to get started. I'm going to get you some ideas of how we got involved in Vietnam and the dates and so forth. We're going to go way back in time, uh, almost to back, uh, well, it goes back before I was born. So that does go way back in time. So as we're going right along, in September 22nd, 1940, French allows Japan to station troops in northern Vietnam. Now, you got to remember that one time uh, when France was taken over by the Germans, they kind of joined each other and became uh, uh, best buddies and uh, so forth. So uh, because that was they were allies with Germany, uh, the French, uh, when Japanese come in and took over uh, uh uh, let's see, uh, French Indochina, my mouth went, wouldn't work. French Indochina there, they come in and took it over. And what they allowed the French to continue running the government and so forth because they just wanted to get in there where they could stop some of the flow of supplies and so forth to China. Uh, so they kept the French administration in place for a little while, but then they got tired of that, especially when the French quit being an ally and kicked them out and so forth. In August 13, 1942, Ho Chi Minh goes to China asking for help in fighting the Japanese. Uh, but he's arrested and held for 13 months in jail. And then, then they let him go. On September 20th, 1944, Ho Chi Minh is set free by the Chinese and returns to Vietnam. Now, this is where it starts getting interesting. The United States sends Ho Chi Minh help from the American Office of Strategic Services, that is called the OSS, to arm and train the Viet Minh, who is the uh, military force that Ho Chi Minh put together. Uh, they trained them to harass the Japanese and rescue down American pilots. So we went into uh, Vietnam and we sent the OSS in there with weapons and so forth. And Ho Chi Minh and General Jip, who uh, wasn't a general at the time, we uh, basically taught them which end of the rifle to hold and, and so forth. So uh, we kind of taught them uh, just about everything that uh, they knew right off to start with. Now, you see the two arrows there. The, the first arrow on your left-hand side of the page, that is uh, Ho Chi Minh. And the little short guy with the hat on, that's General Jip. Now, the OSS Deer Team, that's what the code name was for them. Members posed with the Viet Minh leaders. The Viet Minh, again, is where the communist uh, uh, Vietnamese, I know, I'm not going to say North or South, they were communist Vietnamese at that time. Uh, yep. And during training at Tantro in August of 1945, the Deer Team members standing left and right are Rene de Forno, I'm going to say, okay, then Ho, and then Allison Thomas, the guy that was kind of put it together with that cute little mustache he has there, and uh, Jip, and then Henry Pruner and Paul 
Hogeland, I wish people would get in, interesting names that could be pronounced easy. Far right, Nita's left are Lance Bogut and Aaron Squires. And the guy on the far right, uh, they don't tell who he is, but it looks like he's probably a bit man. But that's why uh, we are uh, teaching them how to uh, uh, carry on and so forth. Now, Thomas and a smaller team of Americans have been in French Indochina with Ho and Jip for two months as part of the Office of Strategic Services, OSS missions, to train Viet Minh guerrillas and gather intelligence to use against the Japanese in the waning days of World War II. Dear team members supervise small arms training at Ho's and Tan Tro's uh, jungle camp in August 1945. And I read when I was putting this together that uh, uh, Ho didn't even know how to use a shovel when they when they first started this. So uh, it was obviously he had not been outside doing a whole lot of stuff like manual labor uh, over his years. Uh, the Americans showed the Viet Minh, most were recent civilians, by the way, uh, how to fire the M1 rifle and M1 carbine and uh, how to use mortars, grenades, bazookas, and machine guns. For training, they used U.S. Army field manuals and focused on guerrilla warfare. So we took everything. We basically went in there and told them everything we knew. Okay. During the second week in August, the team's radio operator, that's the DEER team of the OSS, picked up a broadcast on August 15th announcing the Japanese surrender, following the atomic bombs on Hiroshima on August 6th and the Nagasaki on the, on the 9th. Now, now they realize that Hey, we you don't need we don't the war's basically over. The Japanese have give up. We don't need to be training these guys. Our mission's over. So the deer team issued arms to the soldiers because that's what they were told to do, and prepared to leave the following day. They just gave all the all the uh, Viet men all the weapons they had and said, "These are yours. Do what you want to with them," and get ready to leave. Uh, under the terms of Japanese surrender, the British would occupy the south of Vietnam, and the Chinese would have moved to north moved to the north to disarm Japanese soldiers and return to their homeland. Now, that's what the agreement was, but the Japanese basically turned uh, themselves over and surrendered to Ho Chi Minh, which kind of put him in power uh, there before the British got there. Ho Chi Minh claimed leadership and was elected president of the provisional government on August 27th. They proposed and voted on a new national anthem and a new national flag with a gold star on a red background. September 2, 1945, Ho Chi Minh declared New Republic of Vietnam's independence from France and its colonial rule. France had been in Vietnam for many, many, many years, and they didn't always treat the Vietnamese people uh, very well. They were kind of uh, stuck up and did their own thing. Uh, but he claimed that uh, they were independent, free now of the colonial rule. In his speech, he used part of the American Declaration of Independence where he says, all men are born equal with inviolable rights, life, liberty, and happiness. Uh, and inviolable rights, I don't think is uh, in ours, but uh, uh, that was uh, he put that in. Uh, basically, he was saying, hey, it's my country and y'all better leave me alone. But it didn't work that way. U.S. Army Major, now this is right after they got news that the bomb in Japanese was over with before he got ready to leave. Uh, U.S. Army Major Allison Thomas was having dinner with Ho Chi Minh and General uh, Nguyen and Jip on September 15, 1945, and he had one question he was mulling over before he even left to return to Vietnam. To America. Yeah, to America. Thank you. Ho had claimed power a few weeks early in North Vietnam and had been ambiguous with his allegiance and his intents. In other words, this guy was saying, hey, I'm the new leader of this country. This is a new country. But he didn't say who is going to be his buddies. Thomas decided to get right to the question he had been mulling over. He asked Ho point blank, was he a communist? Ho replied, yes, but we can still be friends, can't we? Was it a failure of American intelligence agencies to recognize that Ho Chi Minh was a Soviet-trained communist ideologue, or did the American government just look for any ally that would fight the Japanese? Ho Chi Minh got his communist trainings in Soviet Union and also some in, uh, in China. Now, this is what his quote was, Our resistance will be long and painful. But whatever the sacrifices, however long the struggle, we shall fight to the end until Vietnam is fully independent 
and reunified. Now, Ho Chi Minh was somewhat of a nationalist, but on top of being a nationalist, he was also a communist. Uh, he wanted Vietnam as one country, which was a lot. Most people in Vietnam did want Vietnam as one country instead of being divided or being a colony of another country. But the difference was some of them didn't want to be communist and some of them did want to be communist. And that's where the kind of the rift came from. Okay. As part of the Potsdam Agreement at the end of World War II, I wish that the Vietnamese had no vote. About 5,000 British troops were sent to South Indochina to disarm the Japanese on September 3rd, 1945. Now, the Allied powers and all got together and decided they're going to what to do with Vietnam and so forth, but nobody invited the Vietnamese. They were left out of the party. With Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh taking power, the British commander gave the order for all imprisoned French troops to be armed. Remember, the Japanese had taken over uh, and had arrested all the French troops until they got kicked out. So now the British commander is going to give the old French troop guys weapons to go back because he needs them to go in and fight uh, Ho Chi Minh and the, and the Viet Minh. They were to stop the rebel government and reestablish French colonial rule, which was exactly what Ho Chi Minh did not want. September 22, 1945. The French and British troops entered Saigon and attacked the rebel forces, which would be the uh, Viet Minh. The battle turned to a rampage where the French and British troops killed hundreds of women and children. This created a lot of unrest in Saigon and probably led to the first American to be killed in Vietnam. Peter Dewey, September 26, 1945, he and his group were sent by the Americans to uh, work with the British. The uh, Dewey and the British commander did not get along, so he was kind of recalled. And uh, we're going to get into how he got killed in just a moment. Uh, the first American killed in Vietnam, he was a lieutenant colonel in the OSS, which later became the CIA. He was killed driving an unmarked Jeep near the Saigon Golf Course he was ambushed by the Viet Minh, who may have mistaken him for a French officer. Now, there's two different versions of how he got killed. All of them, he ends up dead. Okay. On September 26, 1945, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Dewey, a U.S. Army officer with the Office of Strategic Services in Vietnam, is shot and killed in Saigon. Dewey was the head of a seven-man team sent to Vietnam to search for missing American pilots and to gather information on the situation in the country after the surrender of the Japanese. However, Dewey was an outspoken man who soon angered Gracie, Gracie who happened to be the guy was for the British guy who was in charge, eventually resulting in the British general ordering him to leave Indochina. If you don't agree with me, get out. On the way to the airport, accompanied by another OSS officer, Captain Henry Blueshell, Dewey refused to stop at a roadblock manned by three Vietnamese men soldiers. He yelled back at them in French, and they opened fire, killing Dewey instantly. Blueshell was unhurt and escaped on foot. It was later determined that the Viet men had fired on Dewey, thinking he was French. So this is him going, getting ready to go to the airport and, and leave. Okay. Now, same outcome, different story. On September 26, 1945, Dewey was on his way to an OSS-controlled villa for a lunch meeting with foreign correspondents Bill Downs and James McGlincy. He never made it. A firefight broke out between the Viet Minh and the meager personnel at the villa in the wake of his death. The two Americans had been passing a barricade in their jeep. Dewey guessed it to the Viet Minh ahead to remove the crisscross trees forming the roadblock. But they suddenly opened fire with a machine gun. The colonel's head was blown off. Blue Shield, unharmed, jumped out of the Jeep and sprinted frantically up the road. This take, uh, text or story was taken from a war correspondent Clark Lee's 1947 memoir, One Last Look Around. So, either way, the Viet Minh who thought uh, Dewey was uh, a French officer uh, opened fire and killed him. Uh, either he was going to the, uh, to the meeting or he was going to catch the airplane, or maybe he was going to do both. Uh, 
Now, Dewey's body was never recovered. For months afterwards, the French used the missing American's body as a bargaining point against the Viet Minh. They refused to enter discussions until the body was produced and the Vietnam government even offered a reward for the corpse. Peter Dewey is not listed on the Vietnam Memorial Wall. We had not officially were in war, I guess, yet. Now, in 1945, Lieutenant Colonel A. Peter Dewey is sent to Indochina to gather intelligence on this situation. Dewey reported, Cochin, China, southern Vietnam is burning. The French and the British are finished here, and we, the United States, are to clear out of Southeast Asia. That may be somewhat, the British colonel, or general kind of got upset about it. Anyway, uh, they didn't have to worry about uh, Peter Dewey for long, unfortunately. Now, on February 28, 1946, Ho Chi Minh writes a letter to American President Harry S. Truman asking for American assistance in Vietnam's fight for independence. He wanted Truman to uh, end the French colony rule by the French and let Vietnam be run by itself. And the letter he has, that is a copy of the letter, and I'm going to read it to you. Uh, President Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam Democratic Republic of Hanoi, to the President of the United States of America, Washington, D.C. Now, the date, again, is February 28, 1946, which is the same date on the letter. That's pretty good. It was sent us a telegram. On behalf of the Viet Minh government and people, I beg to inborn, in, and I can't tell what it's in, I probably inform you that in course of conversation between Vietnam government and French representatives, the latter require that the succession of Co, uh, China, Cochin China and the return of French troops in Hanoi stop. Meanwhile, French population and troops are making active reparations for a coup domain in Hanoi and for military aggressive stop. I therefore most earnestly appeal to you personally and to the American people to interfere urgently in support of our independence and help making the negotiations more in keeping with the principles of the Atlantic and San Francisco charters, respectively, Ho Chi Minh. Well, it was a nice telegram. The only trouble was, if Truman saw it, he just ignored it. It's not certain whether he even saw it or not, but either way, it was ignored. Now, December 19, 1945, the first Indochina War begins. Uh, I think we were in war from the time of, uh, basically, uh, in time from the Japanese uh, surrendered to up to now, but uh, now they're gonna, we're going to call it a real war. Uh, as you can see up there, um, the Ho Chi Minh government and the French government could not reach an agreement on Vietnam's independence. The French government declared the southern part of Vietnam a French colony. On 19th of December, 1946, Ho Chi Minh ordered 30,000 Viet Minh to attack French installations around Hanoi. Okay. And you can see on the map there where Hanoi is. For North Vietnam, the conflict lasted nine years and it ended with the French defeat at Dinh Bien Phu. Now, if you look at the red aerial there, it will show you where Dinh Bien Phu is. Uh, the United States government financed a large part of the French effort. So maybe that's one of the reasons that Truman uh, ignored the uh, telegram, because we were basically financing the French effort uh, there during their war. China officially recognized North Vietnam's Communist Democratic Republic of Vietnam on January 18, 1950. The Soviet Union followed suit a few days later. The Chinese government started sending huge quantities of military goods to North Vietnam. Both China and the Soviet Union pledged support North Vietnam in its fight against the French. Between 1950 and 1970, it is believed that China sent $20 billion dollars in aid to North Vietnam. What did South Vietnam get? Hmm. They didn't get 20 billion. July 21st, 1954, the Geneva Convention divided North Vietnam as a communist country and a South Vietnam as a country to be ruled by Emperor Bao Da. A year later, the emperor was replaced and 
Nook Dan Dem as president of South Vietnam. As you can see, the 17th parallel where the North Vietnam and South Vietnam were divided, uh, that is a, a picture of, of them on the um, uh, Time magazine there. So uh, the reason they wanted the original one of the emperor was because the emperor kind of fit, went along with uh, Ho Chi Minh, what he wanted, so they had to get rid of him. Now, the domino theory is born, the famous theory. In April 7, 1954, in his speech by President Dwight Eisenhower, discussed the possibility that a fall of French Indochina to the communists could set off a domino effect all over Southeast Asia. We heard a lot about that uh, back in the uh, back in the uh, early 60s, late 50s. This thinking was prevailing thinking of the of the spread of communism into Southeast Asia for at least a decade. And you can see the dominoes there. The Vietnamese are trying to push it over, and the American uh, soldiers trying to hold them up. And you can see the different countries there. Uh, Bangladesh, India, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. They were all afraid they were gonna, if those dominoes were going to fall over and communism was going to take over all, all those countries. Okay. May 7, 1954, the decisive surrender of French troops after a 57-day siege at Dien Bien Phu by the Viet Minh led to the end of French colonial rule in Indochina. On July 21st, 1954, Geneva, Switzerland was the location selected for the peace conference between the French and the Viet Minh. Not only were Viet, uh, Vietnam and France represented at the peace conference, but the United States, China, Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom had representatives there. Everybody had an interest of what was going to be good for them. The outcome to be known as the Geneva Accords were far-reaching in its scope and eliminated the French from Vietnam totally. It gave Ho Chi Minh what he said he wanted, kind of. Vietnam controlled by Vietnam, but it didn't get completely the way he wanted. This is the Geneva Accord, what it says. Vietnam was divided on the 17th parallel, as we just saw, making Vietnam two separate countries. North and South Vietnam. Number two, the northern part of Vietnam was to become communist led by Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh. They wanted all of Vietnam to be united as a communist country, of course, uh, but they didn't get that yet. South Vietnamese was to become a nationalist state led by Emperor Bao Dao, along with Prime Minister uh, uh, Ngoc Diem, Diem, as we've already said, that, uh, that they got rid of the emperor. Uh, all prisoners of war to be released and all French forces to leave the north. Okay. Saigon was to be the capital of South Vietnam and Hanoi was to be the capital of North Vietnam. Now this next part is a lot of contention, a lot of disagreement, but I'm going to read to you what, what the agreement was that, but it was an agreement. This has been, been a very contentious, contentious part of the agreement for years. By 1956, elections had to be held with the goal of unifying Vietnam as one country. In other words, they were going to elect uh, new uh, leaders, and Vietnam, whether it went communist or uh, democratic, uh, would all be cited in 1956 during the elections. Uh, this was not part of the final agreement. It was not signed by South Vietnam. It was a, an agreement, but nobody signed it. So it didn't come part of the agreement if nobody signed it. It was just there. Many historians have stated that the United States and South Vietnam would not allow the elections as they were afraid Ho Chi Minh would win. Now, I heard that one while I was in Vietnam, and it may be some truth to it. But if you look at the number of people that fled communism in the north to the south, that wouldn't seem possible. A few people went from South Vietnam to the north, but vast majority came from the north down to South Vietnam. Uh, if you look at the number of people that fled commas in the north to the south, that wouldn't seem possible. Millions of refugees moved south to escape the harsh communist regime and most likely would not vote for communism after they, after they fled it. Uh, Ho Chi Minh was looked at uh, reverently, uh, like uncle, he was uncle, but uh, I think all the people leaving the north, moving south, they uh, experienced some communism because they were, as they were taking over and taking everything away from everybody, and I don't think they'd have ever voted to go back to communism again. 
President Eisenhower and the United States Security Council were worried about Geneva Accords' outcome leading all of Vietnam to become communist, which was part, may have been one of the reasons that they were not too crazy about having the elections. But it was not necessarily an agreement because it was not part of the Sino, Sino uh, Geneva Accords that was signed. Eisenhower felt the division in communist expansion, the domino theory, was going to lead to hostilities and pledged support to the South. In other words, he had an inkling that uh, with the two countries there, the communists, as they won't, always want to do, want to expand. So it was just a matter of time before they uh, decided to uh, come down and, and help and take over the South. So he, he uh, pledged to support the South. And the Geneva Accords allowed for a 300-day period of grace, allowing people to travel freely between the two countries. That way, the people who wanted communism could move north, the people who didn't want uh, communism could move south, and the people who wanted to uh, uh, sneaky and be uh, working for North Vietnam, uh, but they mo- some of them moved to the south also because they could so they could get in and get started. But you can see the Vietnamese people uh, getting on the ships, the French. And uh, and American uh, ships, uh, so forth, uh, moved people. Uh, in September 1954, Operation uh, Passage to Freedom began. More than a half a million people moved south with American and French support. Richard B. Fitzgibbon, Jr. of North Weymouth, Massachusetts, is listed by the United States Department of Defense as having a casual date of June 8, 1956. Now, this was much later than Dewey. He was killed by another soldier. Ironically, his name is listed on the wall with that of his son, Marine Corps Lance, Cor- Lance, Marine Corps Lance Corporate Richard B. Fitzgibbon III, who was a casualty date of September 7th, 1965. Now, he was not originally put on the wall. If you would notice one while ago when I showed you the wall, it says that the war started in 1959. He was killed in 1956, but his family and some politicians uh, demanded he be put on the wall, so he is now on the wall. Uh, so, Even though there had been terrorist attacks in South Vietnam, North Vietnam disavowed anything to do with them. In other words, from the time that they moved south and it was a North, a North Vietnam and South Vietnam, there were terrorist attacks going on in South Vietnam. Hotels were burnt, uh, blown up, uh, all different things. Uh, you had to be careful when you went out to eat because the restaurants were blown up. Uh, but, of course, the uh, North Vietnam said we, they had nothing to do with it whatsoever. It was all all the, uh, the guerrillas of South Vietnam. December 20th, 1960, North Vietnam officially announced the formation of the National Liberation Front. The NFL was seen as North Vietnam's shadow government in Vietnam. Okay, those are the guys that were sneaky and had the government, but they were uh, based on the guerrillas. The president then gave them the name of Viet Cong. He, it was kind of a, a derivative name, uh, which was Vietnamese communist. That was kind of, a, uh, we're going to call you a nasty name, and that was the nasty name he came up with. It's Viet Cong or Vietnamese communist. On May 11th, 1961, President John F. Kennedy sent 400 Green Berets special advisors to South Vietnam to train the South Vietnamese military. So we've been there in Vietnam, but now in 1961, we're selling 400 advisors, special trained advisors, the Green Berets. Uh, Green Berets were originally part of the CIA, but in, uh, along about that time, Kennedy took them out and put them in, uh, uh, in, at Fort Bragg and their own unit, special forces. May 12, 1961, President Lyndon Johnson visited President Diem in South Vietnam where he relayed a message from President Kennedy and the United States had faith in the government of South Vietnam and offered more military support. Okay. So what we're doing is we're starting that landslide here. Okay. October 18th through 24th, 1961, President Kennedy sends aides Maxwell Taylor and Walt Rostow to visit Vietnam to assess the situation. They report that if South Vietnam goes, it will exceedingly be exceedingly difficult to hold Southeast Asia from going communist. In other words, they were big proponents of the domino theory. Okay. On October 24, 1961, 
Kennedy sends additional military advisors and helicopters to South Vietnam to prevent a communist takeover of Vietnam. As you can see there, the helicopter, that was called the Flying Banana, they were not armed. They basically would take the Vietnamese troops someplace and drop them off. But if they got shot at, that was tough because they had no way to shoot back. On December 31st, 1961, U.S. forces had increased to 3,200 in South Vietnam. We went from uh, just 400 to 3,200 3, just almost overnight. Now, Operation Ranch Hand begins January 12th, 1962. It was a program to defoliate jungle cover as requested by South Vietnamese President Diem. In other words, he, he's the one that wanted it, uh, the uh, Agent Orange and Blue and so forth. The beginning of Agent Orange, Black, White, Blue, and other chemical agents. Herbicide warfare uh, program employed in Vietnam, Agent Orange was the most commonly used among the rainbow herbicides. The plan was by using the herbicides, it would reduce the cover of the Viet Cong, forcing them into open combat. The herbicides would be sprayed from helicopters and airplanes. January 15, 1962. During a press conference, President Kennedy is asked by reporters if any U.S. American troops are engaged in the fighting in Vietnam. He says no. Now, we know the president wouldn't lie. 3,200 people. I mean, we only had 3,200 people over there as advisors, and you went out with the guys, and they got shot at, and they probably never, you know, shot back or anything. Uh, February 1st, 1962, the first regular ground forces are sent to Vietnam. They were the 39th Signal Battalion and Communications Unit. They were assigned to Tonsonute Air Base. Uh, Johnson, president, when he, Johnson became president, he made a speech. And he said the first man to get killed in Vietnam was a young man by the name of Davis. They named the uh, facilities there at Tonsonute after him, Davis uh, Station. But he was not the first uh, man. He was like the fourth or fifth. But uh, So everybody thinks Davis Station was named after the first guy, but he was not. Uh, February 8, 1962, MACV, Military Assistance Command, was established in Vietnam to run the United States military actions. Now, we still aren't fighting in Vietnam, okay, officially, because the president said no, okay? The war keeps going. May 11th, 1962, Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, visits Vietnam and reports, we are winning the war. The Vietnamese are winning the war because we're not involved, okay? August 1st, 1962, the Foreign Assistance Act of 1962 is signed by President Kennedy, calling for military assistance to countries which are on the edge of the communist world and under direct attack. Make a long story short, it says that if you if you if you are in the, uh, uh, being attacked by the communists, we're going to do whatever we need to do to help you out. Okay, but right now. May 8, 1963, South Vietnamese troops fire on a gathering of 20,000 Buddhists in Way. President Diem denied any government involvement in the incident. Like they didn't, had nothing to do with it, uh, but the Vietnamese troops uh, it fired on and killed a lot of them. Uh, June 27, 1963, Kennedy appoints Henry Cabot Lodge to be the U.S. ambassador to Vietnam. Washington is extremely aware of President Dem's regime because they're getting a lot of feedback from that killing of the uh, all the Buddhists. So uh, everybody's worried about what somebody else is going to say. I think uh, the other countries. Uh, we fought a lot of the, we fought most of the war worried about what the rest of the world was going to think about or that China might come in to come in a war. On August 24, 1963, Ambassador Lodge is told to give President Diem one last chance to resolve the Buddhist crisis. That is uh, 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 Ambassador Lodge there, and that is De the short guy is, uh, is Diem. If Diem refused to make the needed reforms, then Lodge was to give approval for a coup. In other words, if he don't straighten out, we're going to get rid of him. But I thought it was his country. <laughs> oh, well. October 2nd, 1963, Ambassador Lodge is informed by President Kennedy that no initiative should be now be taken to give any encouragement to a coup. 
That lodge was to identify and build contacts with possible leadership as and when it appears. In other words, we don't want nothing to do with the coup, but when it happens, not if it happens, when it happens, you need to be ready. October 5th, 1963, a Vietnamese general, Dong Van, called him Big Men, asked if the military aid to South Vietnam would continue if them was removed. The CIA gives the go-ahead. Now, the United States just says we had nothing whatsoever to do with the coup. November 1st, 1963, a coup is initiated. President Diem did not have a wife, but he had his brother who was kind of like his uh, unofficial vice president, and she, he had a wife, was Madame Nu, and Madame Nu was kind of like the first lady of, of, of South Vietnam, and she was a character herself. Uh, she talked about when the uh, Buddhist uh, priest uh, set himself on fire uh, there in Saigon, she talked about, you know, should have, they should have had a barbecue. Uh, now, she had left, was actually in the United States when this happened, but they came in and kicked out uh, Nim and his brother. On November 4th, 1963, the United States officially recognized the provisional government of South, the new provisional government of South Vietnam. Uh, Dim and his brother are put into uh, a jail, and then they were going to be uh, let go and go, so they could leave the country and so forth. But, well, they just got kind of killed in the process of uh, leaving. Then, shortly after that, November 22, 1963, President Kennedy is assassinated in Dallas, Texas. As you can see there, right after the shot, uh, First Lady is uh, trying to do what she can do, blood all over the uh, back. Of, and, and seconds later, you see you'll, you would see one of the uh, uh, Secret, Poli Secret Service guys jumping on the back of the car trying to get in. On November 24, 1963, President Lyndon Baines Johnson announces that he, that the U.S. will continue with military aid to South Vietnam. And there's been rumors for years that Kennedy was thinking about getting us out of Vietnam. Whether he was or whether he wasn't really doesn't make much difference now. But uh, from, it almost sounds like he was, but then I've, I've read places that they said he was changing his mind. So anyway, okay. January 31st, 1964, General Nguyen Khan takes command of South Vietnam and asks for a U.S. support and receives President Johnson's full support. On April 25th, 1964, General Westmoreland is named commander of MACB, Military Assistance, uh, Assistance Command, Vietnam. And you can see all them stars there on, on good General Westmoreland. And, of course, the uh, Vietnamese generals got three. So, uh, Y'all don't like them stars. Okay. Now, June 6, 1963, the first American pilot is taken prisoner after being shot down over eastern Laos. He is Lieutenant Charles Klusman. He is held for 86 days and escapes. But y'all got to remember now, we're not in war. We're not even a police action. We're just hanging around. 8 July 1st, 1964, General Maxwell Taylor is appointed to become the U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam. July 9th, 1964, Communist China states they will defend North Vietnam if it is invaded by the United States. Oh, did that statement right there create a problem in Washington? Actually, it created more problems for the soldiers in, in, in Vietnam. July 31st, 1964, South Vietnamese commandos raid two North Vietnamese Navy bases on the island on the Gulf of Tonkin. Okay, this is an important date. July 31st, 1964, South Vietnamese commandos raid two North Vietnamese Navy bases on islands in the Gulf of Tonkin. This action is near the vicinity of the U.S. destroyer Maddox, who's on tour in the Gulf of Tonkin. August 2nd, three North Vietnamese gunboats attacked the Mattis 10 miles off the coast of North Vietnam. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I think if the, uh, the Chinese or the Russians or uh, Syria, any one of these countries out there were 10 miles off the coast of the United States or off the coast of North Carolina, we'd have a tendency to do something about it. And you got to remember the South Vietnamese 
uh, attacked them, and there were the American ships out there. So they kind of put two and two together, I guess, and and went out and attacked them um, 10 miles off the coast of North Vietnam. The attack caused minimum damage to uh, the Maddox, uh, with U.S. planes sinking one of the boats and, and shooting up some of the others. But you can see that there, the 17th parallel, and up there is the uh, Gulf of Tonkin, and the red spot is kind of the uh, where the Gulf of Tonkin incident happened or didn't happen. Okay. Now, August, go, go back one. Just don't want to point something out. Now, this is August 2nd. Now, we start getting real fast here. August 2nd. Okay, remember that. August 3rd, 1964. The U.S. Maddox and USS C. Uh, C. Turner Joy continued to monitor in the, the Gulf of Tonkin. Nervous crew members believe they have come under a torpedo attack from North Vietnamese patrol boats. No evidence can be found of this actually happening. Both ships opened fire, but there were no actual sightings of any attacking boats. On April 4th, 1964, the White House orders limited bombing missions on North Vietnam. Now, from what I understand, that Johnson didn't even know about this, that uh, McNamara uh, ordered the uh, bombings uh, because, well, the admiral had uh, radioed back to uh, the White House that he didn't think the attack really happened, but let them do some more investigations. But nobody told Johnson that. On August 5th, 1964, Navy fighter bombers fly 64 sorties against the Gulf of Tonkin. They attack North Vietnam naval bases and attack an oil storage facility. Two U.S. planes were shot down and two were damaged. August 5th, 1964, opinion polls show 85% of the people were in favor of the White House decision. Now, here's an incident that started... Our, our officially activities in the Vietnam War, even though we'd been there for a while, uh, it didn't happen. It was just somebody thought it happened, but somebody made a mistake, and then somebody said, well, we probably made a mistake, but somebody went ahead and did it anyway, okay? Now, this is the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and I can't, I can't read it real good right there. So I'm going to just let it go, but I can say that it puts us in the, uh, in the from this far, uh, it puts us into, uh, well, I can't say war because we weren't really in war with North Vietnam officially. We puts us in a police action uh, with um, uh, North Vietnam. August 7th, 1964, the U.S. Senate voted 82 to 2 in the House by a vote of 416 to 0 to approve Public Law 88408, which became known as the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and giving President Johnson the power to take all necessary measures toward North Vietnam. To take all necessary measures towards North Vietnam. Okay. Now, one of the reasons that it was never declared a war uh, Johnson was real big on the New Deal. Uh, the Johnson was going to had all, all kinds of social problems or programs get, uh, out there uh, and so forth. But he knew if he went to Congress and said, I want you to finance a war and I want you to finance my social problems, that it couldn't got both of them done. So uh, we never start, had a war in Vietnam. We had a, uh, a, a police action. Uh, so he went to the Congress with his... Um, uh, his support for uh, social affairs. August 26, 1964, the Democratic National Convention nominates Lyndon Johnson to run for president. Johnson declares we are not going to send, and this, I put John there, but I, I made a mistake there. It should be Johnson declares we are not going to send U.S. boys nine or 10,000 miles away from home to do what the Asian boys are to be doing for themselves. This is why he was running for president. Now, you remember he was president after Kennedy got assassinated, but now he's running for president for his own time, okay? But we weren't going to send U.S. boys to do what the Asian boys should be doing for themselves, okay? October 14, 1964, Nikita Khrushchev, who was quite a character, the leader of the Soviet Union is ousted from power and Leonard Brezhnev, takes over and declares the Soviet Union will increase military aid to North Vietnam. November 1st, 1964, Viet Cong forces attack Benoit 
Air Base, 20 miles north of Saigon. The attack kills five Americans and two South Vietnamese and destroys some planes. But as this was two days from election, Johnson chose not to retaliate because he was afraid it would cost him the election if he retaliated. So that attack didn't happen. That's pretty good. The, the Gulf of Tonkin attack didn't happen, but this one did, but we're going to ignore the Okay. Uh, tr never try to get logical when you're dealing with Vietnam War or government. On November 3rd, 1964, Lyndon Baines Johnson is elected president in a landslide victory. December 5th, 1964. I guess we can do this now because we're officially in a police action. Captain Roger Donlan becomes the first to be awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions in Vietnam. You are to uh, look him up and read the story. It's quite a story. On December 31st, 1964, there are 23,000 American military in South Vietnam. They snuck in about 20,000 on us there. That was estimated 170,000 North Vietnamese troops in South Vietnam. 23,000 Americans, 170,000 North Vietnamese. Well, they did have the South Vietnamese. On January 27th, 1965, National Security Advisor Bundy and the Secretary of Defense tell President Johnson that the United States' limited involvement in Vietnam was failing and that it had to reach, that it had reached a crossroads. We got to do something or get off the pot, okay? On March 2nd, 1965, one of the major expansions of the war was begun. Operation Rolling Thunder. President Johnson ordered a massive bombing campaign called Rolling Thunder. Air Force and Navy planes began the first sustained American attack into North Vietnam. There were more bombs dropped in Vietnam than all of World War II. Initially planned to last eight weeks, but lasted three years. American planes also started airstrikes on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. On March 8, 1965, the first combat troops, hey, we're getting official now. The first combat troops arrived at Red Beach, South Vietnam, been there, uh, in Da Nang. Uh, 3,500 Marines land to guard the Da Nang U.S. Air Base. Also the first deployment of the MA, M4A3 A tanks arrived. Now, they were sent over there just to guard, basically to guard the uh, air base there at Da Nang. Uh, they landed just like the Marines landed in Iwo Jima, but they were greeted by high school students going to welcome U.S. Marines and putting lays around their neck. But they did get occasional sniper fire during that process. Now, on March 24th, 1965, the first teaching is held at the University of Michigan. 200 faculty members take part in a protest by conducting anti-war seminars. And the war goes on. April 1st, 1965, Johnson authorized an additional two more Marine battalions and 20,000 logistical troops. He also authorized the Marines to conduct patrols to find and engage the enemy. So no longer, they are now no longer guards. They're actually Marines. April 17th, 1965, 15,000 students gather in Washington, D.C. to protest the U.S. bombing campaign in North Vietnam. April 24, 1965, President Johnson authorizes the troops in Vietnam to receive combat pay. So now we're really official. We got combat pay. 1965, May 3rd, 1965, 3,500 troops of the 173rd Airborne began to arrive in Vietnam. Sent the Marines, now we're sent to 173rd. On June 18th, 1965, for the 10th South Vietnamese government in 20 months. We've had 10 different groups of government in 20 months. Air Marshal Nguyen Cao Ki takes power along with Nguyen Van Thu. Now, if you never had a chance to meet uh, Nguyen Cao Ki, he was a character in himself. Boy, talking about flamboyant, oh, his uniform looked like it was melted down and put on him. Oh, he was a character. But he was also a good soldier. Uh, always had good-looking women on his arm. Uh, but that's him uh, there with his uh, sexy mustache. And, but he was, he was quite a soldier. Okay. On June 6, 1965, the first search and destroy mission begins. Hey, we're actually getting into this thing now. 
General Westmoreland created the strategies to land ground troops into enemy territory, search out the enemy, destroy them, and immediately withdraw the U.S. forces. The traditional strategy to attack and hold the areas provided to be useless against the North Vietnamese and, and Viet Cong. So then we had to come up with how are we going to tell whether we're winning or losing? Well, somebody come up with a great way. It's called body count. The body count was introduced to measure success of a search and destroy mission. So if you go out and you look for the enemy and you kill 10 of them today and you only lose one soldier, then we won. Kind of. Unless you're that one soldier. The only trouble was, was a, remember a while ago, it was 23,000 Americans and 170,000. Uh, it's going to take a whole lot more body counts than that. On, on June, July 1st, 1965, the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile is officially activated, becoming the U.S.'s first Air Mobile Division. On July 28, 1965, President Johnson announces he would send 44 combat battalions Additionally to Vietnam, he also raised the draft quota to 35000 a month. In other words, those were the guys he was starting to conscript into the military to uh, be sent to Vietnam or wherever, okay? And the war goes on. July 30th, 1965. A lot of you would be surprised about this. The U.S. Coast Guard sets up five surveillance centers in South Vietnam. Uh, they had people killed in Vietnam. August 3rd. 1965, CBS News shows a video of U.S. Marines burning down a village near Da Nang. This raised a great deal of anger and disgust in America. We're going in and burning down a village. Folks, this is war. We didn't mass bomb like in World War II, but you go in there and it's a Viet Cong village, a communist village, and that's where the communists are staying. You need to burn it down. But we were all of a sudden bad guys because we burned down a, a, a straw house. I mean, even the three little pigs had a straw house blown away. August 31st, 1965, Congress passes an amendment to the Selective Service Act that made it illegal to destroy the draft card, a five-year prison sentence, and a $10,000 fine. Oh, yes, everybody's getting together and burning their draft card. That was the thing. Make love, not war, and burn your draft card. President Johnson, in an attempt to create a peace dialogue with North Vietnam, hauled a bombing of North Vietnam for 37 days. That happened August 31st, 1965. He said, hey, we're going to stop rolling thunder, but y'all, if y'all come on, go with us, and we'll sit down and talk. Didn't, didn't work. On September 11th, 1965, the 1st Cavalry Division arrives at Quinh Yon, South Vietnam, making American troops levels at 125,000. I mean, it hadn't been about six months or so. We only had, a, a, you know, 23,000. Uh, October 23rd, 1965, North Vietnamese forces attacked a small special forces camp at Playmay. This attack will bring about the first major battle of the war. This is when the United States kind of got the uh, special forces camp was overrun. Uh, they were, uh, Viet Cong were driven back. Well, this started the, started the dominoes for what happens next. On November 8th, 1965, the 173rd Airborne on Operation Hump, War Zone D in Vietnam, were ambushed by over 1,200 VC. 48 American soldiers lost their lives that day. Severely wounded and risking his own life, Lawrence Joel, a medic, was the first living black American since the Spanish-American War to receive the United States Medal of Honor for saving so many lives in the midst of battle that day. Now, I didn't do that as good as, uh, as Chris Christopherson did. What I just read you was the opening of a song by uh, Big, Big and Rich. Uh, about their friend, uh, Niles Harris. Niles Harris was a radio operator there at that battle, uh, and they wrote a song called uh, 8th of November about Operation Hump, and that's the, what I just read you was a description of that battle uh, by uh, Chris Christopherson, which is on the first of that song. But that was uh, to them, that was the uh, first big battle of, uh, of Vietnam, uh, the Battle of Hump. Lawrence Joel, if you've ever been to Winston-Salem, been to Joel Coliseum, that's who it's named after. That's where he's from, is Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So let's see what else we're going to get into now. Oh, yes. 
on November 14th through the 16th, 1965, as a result of the North Vietnamese attack on Special Forces at Playmay, South Vietnamese soldiers and U.S. soldiers were tasked to wipe out all the enemy forces in Pleiku province. The Battle of Ai Drang Valley between the 1st Cavalry and North Vietnamese forces was the first major battle of the Vietnam War. And if you saw the movie or read the book, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, this is the battle that was made famous by uh, that book and the movie. Now, I have a picture there of a man. Uh, I want to make sure I get this before we get out of uh, time. His name is Rick Riscorda. Uh, Rick was, uh, was, was, from, uh, from, was a British. He was in uh, uh, several different militaries in Europe. But he came to the United States, and uh, he well, became a lieutenant. And uh, Hal Moore's group were under attack, as you remember from the movie, and they started bringing in ref- uh, to bringing in uh, replacements and so forth. Well, uh, Rick's group landed just about dark, and they couldn't tie in with Hal Moore's group, so they had to stay where they were, kind of surrounded by bad guys. And Rick Rescorder walked around all night long, kind of whispering and singing to his guys to keep them uh, from getting too jumpy. Uh, and then when the... Um, uh, daylight came, they had tied in and uh, fought with Hal Moore and so forth. Uh, he was such a tough soldier, they called him hard, uh, hardcore, uh, hard charger. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about more about him. Uh, he got out of the military and went to college and got a degree, and then he started working with Dean Whittier. And Dean Whittier's office was at the uh, World Trade Center. And some years back, I cannot remember what year it was now, a uh, senior moment, but uh, the Muslims uh, put a uh, car bombs in the basement of the World Trade Center and blew up and did a lot of damage there, but didn't really uh, make the building fall down or anything. But Rick Rescorda goes, hey, this building is very vulnerable to attack. So he convinced Dean Whitty, he was head of security for Dean Whitty there, and he convinced Dean Whitty that they need to do a fire drill type situation. So when the planes hit the towers, Rick was there. He was not supposed to be there. He was supposed to be on an airplane on the way to his daughter's wedding in uh, England. But he was there, and through his leadership and what he had taught all those people, he is credited with saving 2,700 lives. He got 2,700 of Dean Whittier's people out in an orderly fashion because they had been trained on what to do. But Rick went back in to help two or three others who would not uh, come down, and they have never seen Rick or any part of him since that time. So we have uh, heroes from Vietnam who came heroes back here. On November 17th, 1965, the units that finally relieved Colonel Hal Moore's troops at the Adrang Valley Battle were ordered to march out in lieu of being flown out by a helicopter. Now, what I read was that they didn't want to have the helicopters come in and get this unit out because it looked like they were trying to uh, escape or retreat. So they decided to walk these guys out, and they were supposed to walk to Landing Zone, Albany. During the march, the soldiers got strewn out over a large distance, and 500 North Vietnamese soldiers attacked the 400 Americans, resulting in the loss of 155 Americans, almost, almost half of them. Uh, from people there, I understand that you were laying in the bushes and you bumped somebody. You didn't know if it was a good guy and a bad guy. You just shot. So that was uh, the Battle of Idrang Valley, who was the fir- official first big battle of the Vietnam War. But on November 7, 27, 1965, the Pentagon informed President Johnson that if General Westmoreland was to be successful with the current action plan, that U.S. troop strength would need to be raised 400,000 troops double the amount already in country. We just keep adding. November 27, 1965, 35,000 war protesters demonstrated in front of the White House and marched to the Washington Monument for a rally. And the war goes on while people are out protesting. Okay. During 19, uh, December 9, 1965, the New York Times reports that the U.S. and Auburn forces have not been able to stop the flow of war materials from North Vietnam on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Now, note, the trail was not just a trail. The trail has all, uh, lots of shoots off of it. It was an elaborate system of trails with repair parties right there on site. They had, they'd go into, the commerce would go into villages 
and get people in the villages and, and move them out to along the trail. And if you bomb the trail before the planes got back to the base, they were already out there raking and smoothing the trail out. As you can see there with trucks with uh, leaves and all stuff going up and going down the trail. They even had elephants going up and down the trail. Our uh, time is out uh, tonight. I uh, wanted to uh, uh, encourage you to tune back in for the next show. We're going to continue this. We're going to get into the Tet Offensive and so forth. But I want to tell you something that's coming up before uh, we get back together. Uh, if y'all remember, I talked about last year this time, the, uh, the three-quarter uh, size moving wall that was going to be in Wake Forest, North Carolina, what is now in Tarboro, North Carolina. Tarboro, North Carolina is right there at Rocky Mount very close to the uh, uh, Virginia line. On the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th, that moving wall will be in Tarboro. The address is Braswell Park, 1501 Western Boulevard in Tarboro. So if you get a chance, you did not see the wall, and you're within an hour or so close uh, to Tarboro, I highly recommend that you uh, uh, get in your car, load your kids up and everything else, and go see this wall. It is an awesome wall. You can actually do etchings on it, just like you do in D.C. It's just smaller. Uh, so you can take a pen and pencil if you have somebody's name on the wall. And while you're doing that, stop by Edgecombe County's uh, museum there uh, and, uh, and, and, and see the, um, and see they've got a beautiful museum there. Uh, as you can see, I'm looking at my calendar because I have totally forgot when the next uh, show is going to be. I know it's going to be sometime this month. Uh, let's see. It's going to be October 23rd. So looking forward to seeing you back here October 23rd, and we'll continue with the dates. As you notice, I've gone through a lot of dates that a lot of things going on. Got nothing that's really separated from the war, but the war kept going on, or the police action. Thank you, and good night. Uh, God bless, and have a great weekend. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.